right, you're welcome back. Soldiers repelled what could have been the deadliest Boko Haram this year. Uh, attacks, that is. Uh, the attackers came in four vehicles and many motorcycles to Buniyadi in Yobe State, but met their match in soldiers of the 27th Task Force. Now, this attack comes less than 24 hours to President Muhammad Buhari's campaign visit uh, to Yobe State. Yeah, TVC's Femi Akonde was on the news last night and told us that security is now tight ahead of President Buhari's visit to the state. President Muhammad Buhari is expected to be in Yobe State tomorrow to flag off the campaigns of the All Progressives Congress here in Yobe State and already there are preparations both from the security and even from the pol in the political scene uh, ahead of President Muhammad Buhari's visit and these attacks one way or the other will cast a shadow on this visit and security agencies will have so much on their plate they have so much to deal with and we are already seeing so much security movement already in Damaturi, the state's capital because this state capital where the president will be visiting tomorrow will have to be highly secured for the president to visit and flag off that campaign all right uh we that, that's Femi Akonde, our correspondent who joined our news uh, late yesterday mm -hmm to give us a breakdown of what's going on. Now, we have joining us in the studio uh, former Assistant Director of State Security Service, Dennis Amakri, in the studio. Good morning, Dennis. Mm. Good morning. Nice Good morning. to have you join us. Yes. We and, also have, of mm. course, um, our correspondent there in Yobe State, Michael Oshoma, uh, joining us. Good morning, Michael. Uh, what can you tell us about this situation in Buniyadi, especially considering the fact that Mr. President will be uh, on ground today? Well, um, last night's attack by <clears throat> the Boko Haram insurgents was um, a shorter one because the, the, the gun deal lasted for like uh, about five hours. And um, the insurgents tried to attack the military formation stationed in Boniyadi community. And the troop of 27th Tactical Brigade, that's the Nigeria Army Special Forces School in Boniyadi, the Gujiba local government area of Yobe State were fully on ground to repel the attack. Many of the terrorists were killed in the course of trying to launch an attack on the military base. And um, it was a jubilant mood for the soldiers and officers of the, 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 the army in that community. It, they, they, they killed the, the, the insurgents and they were able to recover some of their gun truck and um, some other um, ammunition that they were trying to use to, 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 to launch the attack. All right, uh, this is not the first time uh, uh, this attackers will be uh, uh, attacking Buni Yadi, either the people or the military formation and all of that. Let, let's take it down to the people themselves, the residents of Buni Yadi. Mm -hmm. now, how are they living? What, what's, what are they saying when it comes to this constant and constant uh, recurring attacks, either on them or, or the military uh, formation, irrespective of the fact that the military was able to repel them? Yeah, if you, if you, if you remember, in, in the past, Buniyadi happens to be the, one of the strongest holds of Boko Haram. They, were, they captured that town for like eight months in 2014. And um, they, they lasted, they stayed there, it was, they, they, they erected their flag and, and, and all that. So the people in that community are used to um, um, this kind of um, lifestyle, I mean, frequent attack. But for, for, for a while now, for, since 2000 and after the election 2015, down to this moment, we've not experienced much attack compared to um, last night. The, 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 the returnees in that community are trying to stabilize based on the fact that they are trying to reset to pick the pieces of their life because for a long time they've not been able to go to cultivate, to, to go to farm because of landmines and all that. So it's, it's, it's a traumatic moment for them. And having this attack last night is a kind of reminder to them that the insurgent is still within their community and they are hurting the federal government and other security operatives to do the needful to ensure that these insurgents do not come back to take over their community because they are tired of 
um, staying in the in, in, in the IDP camp in, in Damaturu. So now that the government, the, the state government, have put things in place to ensure that they, they are safe, to ensure that they go back to their community, and now another attack is coming, they are like afraid that um, this should not be a constant move by the insurgents. Mm. Michael Oshoma, thank you very much. Our correspondent there in uh, Yobe State, uh, speaking to us about the attacks there by Boko Haram. Uh, uh, Dennis Amakri, um, you, you, I mean, I, I wonder what your thoughts are, uh, considering the fact that Buniyadi is home to Nigerian Army Special uh, Forces yeah. uh, training schools, and this attack by Boko Haram happened 24 hours to the president's uh, planned visit yeah. there today. Uh, you know, um, there is, I don't know if you saw the um, uh, United States uh, intelligence that uh, was sent out to all Americans, mm. and of mm. course to American companies, mm. Mm. that there will be an escalation of mm. uh, attacks by ISIS uh, West Africa, um, the Islamic uh, um, uh, State, uh, West, Africa yeah, State uh, West Africa province mm. and um, uh, Boko Haram. And uh, that has you know, been manifested right now, where we have uh, the attack in uh, Buniyadi. And of course, it is well-timed uh, to happen just 24 hours uh, before the visit of the president. So I think we'll not take it very, very um, uh, lightly. Well, what points do you think the terrorists are trying to make there? They are trying to make a statement. They are trying to make a statement. And uh, you can see that... Um, the intelligence report was very, very clear that they are going to attack military formations, malls and towns, you know, mm. um, as this uh, progresses. Well, as the president will be going to your base state, uh, uh, will be in your base state today for that uh, flag off. Yeah. If precautionary measures will be taken, what would they be looking at? Well, I, I think um, as they are already aware that mm. uh, these kind of attacks are possible. Mm. I think the intelligence had gone out. So um, I, I feel that, uh, or I think it's very, very straightforward that the security agencies have already been there, you know, because this attack is happening about 45 kilometers away from Damatru, where mm -hmm. the president is going to be. So uh, the security agents, I'm, I'm sure, are on ground already to make sure that this uh, attack does not affect the visit. But all the same, you have to realize that they have the whole idea of the Boko Haram people is publicity and to make sure that they, they cause panic and fear, you know, among people. And uh, I will advise, you know, as a, a security analyst that they should not cut off that visit because if they cut it off then the, the, yeah, the terrorists have won, have won mm. because that is the whole idea mm. of um, uh, all these attacks. Uh, so they will go ahead and make sure that at least they put enough security on ground to repel whatever could mm. happen. But, uh, but I wonder yeah. how challenging that mm -hmm. will be because when, if you watch the previous campaigns, anywhere the president is going, the kind of crowd mm -hmm. that yes. gathers there, yes. if you have to take um, uh, precautionary measures and yeah. people are gathering from all over the place, you're going to see hundreds of thousands of people thousands maybe. of people yes i wonder how challenging that is going to be like it you had in um it was it at those states everywhere. yeah you had in where, where, state, you all, all, all the everywhere. places he where the president to. could exactly. not even make his um, yes. speech everywhere yes um it needs planning serious planning event planning security wise because you see um anything could happen uh, they, they, they could uh, cordon off the whole stadium where it's going to happen in Damatru Stadium mm. and then make sure that they screen people that come into the stadium okay. that ahead of time. Mm. And maybe allow for one entrance. Yeah, I, one entrance mm. or even both entrance, but make sure that Properly they are manned. well manned and then people are well screened mm. because um, in that kind of situation, you know, embarrassment could come in any way, anyway, because uh, it is not a 100% thing. Uh, somebody without a weapon could just do an attack. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the whole idea is to embarrass somebody. Mm -hmm. Somebody can pour spit or throw egg or whatever, you, you know, shoe. Yes. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. um, the whole idea or aim is to embarrass 
the VIP. Would you say then that the, the, the Boko Haram uh, insurgents have not necessarily succeeded in this uh, instance? Uh, you know, because the 27 task force was able to push back. Yes. What kind of psychological, um, you know, uh, leverage do you think this would give the Nigerian army? And what does it signal to the Boko Haram that um, it's not... Uh, Business as usual? Yes. Because yeah. it's not the first time they'll be attacking Buniyadi, but okay. in this case, uh, there seems to have been a, you know, some kind of plus yes. for, mm. for the uh, There Nigerian are lessons soldiers. learned mm. on both sides. You know, definitely Boko Haram is going to, Boko Haram feels they've succeeded because the idea is to cause that panic, is to cause that panic and run away. Uh, on the side of, uh, but they know that the military was ready. Mm -hmm. You know, so they will learn and choose their targets now. Uh -huh. But at the same time, even for the Nigerian, uh, the Nigerian military, they will also um, learn their own lesson that in situations like this, ahead of time, they have to prepare themselves. Mm -hmm. I think they were prepared. And in it this looks like they were case. prepared in this case. They were yes. prepared in this mm -hmm. case. Yeah, yeah, but if we have to see from the other side, uh, they were said to have arrived in about four, four or five, five trucks, trucks with mm -hmm. motorcycles and all of that. Coming close to the military uh, uh, brigade where the school is in the first place, yes. to succeed in coming that close mm. is even dangerous enough. We were expecting that. With, with all the intelligence, military intelligence available, they should have been detected long before they even get close to the military barracks or military uh, basement. Uh, well, you have to realize that when this thing happened, it was very early in the morning, mm. you know, and um, you have an asymmetric enemy that does not actually wear uniforms. Uh, you can see pictures of some of them wearing just normal mm. uh, civilian clothes. So they, they, they move very stealthily. And um, their own is to get sure, make sure that they get to that target, you know, cause confusion. Even if they don't uh, kill as many people as they want, they should to just make that statement that, look, we are around. Still still uh, very... We are very active and we are around. Um, you know, since the outbreak of uh, uh, terrorism in Nigeria 2009, uh, it will be 10 years um, mm -hmm. this year, Yeah, uh, I guess. We have been discussing, talking about, you know, the need to infuse intelligence, the right kind of intelligent intelligence, yeah. uh, the right kind of the use of technology and all of that. But it doesn't seem that that has been happening at all. You don't hear about, you know, CCTVs, if not on every street or in every area. But we're not even hearing that we're putting that to use uh -huh. yet, whether it's in the northeast or even, you know, down uh, south in, in, you know, Nigeria. In the northeast, uh, in a way that it can actually give you some kind of lead to the perpetrators of this, um, you know, acts of violence against the state. Yeah, in the northeast, a lot of uh, technology is being used. Okay. Uh, the drone technology is active mm. uh, by the military, and um, these have been going on. Uh, you don't put CCTV at the war front because they are too small. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Definitely drone, not at the war front. Of I course, mean, yes. the drone technology mm -hmm. is very good and uh, they, they are being uh, deployed. Okay. Uh, talking about intelligence, I think mm -hmm. uh, they have enough intelligence to work on. Okay. But I think that uh, well, you, in, when it comes to intelligence, uh, it is nothing is too little or too much because they need as much as they could get. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dennis Amakri, thank okay. you very much for joining us on the program. Thank you, Mark. Uh, the former much. assistant director of uh, SSS, Thank nicknamed you very much. DSS. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. All right. Okay, <laughs> President Mohamed Buhari has assured Nigerians that his administration would not waver in its fight against corruption and ensuring sanity in public service. While the president said his government would ensure that all recovered assets are sold off and the proceeds lodged into the single treasury account. Yeah, President Buhari said he will continue to fish out and jail looters if re-elected, assuring that his government would not be cowed to abandon the corruption war. Well, joining us from Abuja studio is an asset recovery expert uh, who is executive director Africa Network for Environment and Economic Justice, David Ugolo. Thank you very much for joining us uh, this Good morning. Good morning, Reverend Ugolo. Thanks for having, thanks for joining us. All right, let's begin with the uh, strategy which uh, President Buhari has been, you know, uh, making uh, public out there that uh, 
looted, for, looted assets would be sold off immediately based on the experience that they had in 83 when, uh, you know, were looted uh, uh, public property. Were looted. F yeah, exactly, <laughs> were looted or even given back to the people who were alleged to have looted uh, the country and, of course, the, the economy. Uh, what do you think about uh, this strategy? How effective would it be? Again, thank you, Mike and our friend. Thanks for this opportunity once more again. Uh, the issue of uh, Lutera Fund is a global issue. It's not just peculiar to Nigeria alone. And uh, the fact that President Buhari has put it as a major policy priority for Nigeria is something we must commend the government for. And particularly with the fact that uh, the recovered asset from Abasha's family is not going to the very poor, the poorest in Nigeria. And for me, it's something that is very remarkable that any government should uh, take lessons from. And for the president's decision to continue to put priority on recovering of looted assets stashed either in Western Bank or locally, is something that will help redirect the fight against corruption in Nigeria. And it's something that we must continue to support, either at the media level or at the civil society level. But okay. how this is going is something that we need to also uh, remind ourselves that the fight against corruption uh, should not be something that has to be done by an individual. It has to be institutionalized. For instance, we have the proceed of crime bill at the National Assembly. This bill provides an asset recovery framework that will help reorganize the asset recovery architecture in Nigeria. But unfortunately, the proceed of crime bill is yet to be passed into law. Mm -hmm. And that makes it almost impossible for some uh, clarity on the asset recovery architecture in Nigeria. All right, Reverend Ngola. This is not the, very the, good for Yes, I, I know you would have heard so many Nigerians' comments from Nigerians as to what, how recovered loot or recovered funds should be channeled. Now, besides the uh, Abacha loot, which has been uh, distributed or, uh, or embossed, uh, what is it called? given to, disbursed. or disbursed rather, that's the word, disbursed mm -hmm. to uh, market women in the in form of uh, trader money and other uh, social reinvestment. The other loots, which uh, are coming from different places, uh, the government made Nigerians understand it has been uh, uh, sent into the Treasury single account, uh, the TSA. But Nigerians are saying, invest it into tangible projects, tie it to a project that people can see. Because when it goes into the, the TSA or tre uh, Treasury account, uh, no one really knows because when government tells you I've done it, it could be, and no one can really trace that. W what, what do you think about that? Well, I, I don't blame Nigerians uh, who are raising questions around about uh, how recovered asset is utilized. And I think they are not speaking out of the blue. The, it is experience. If you recall um, uh, in 2004, four five that when Abacha money was recovered, it was used for um, projects across the country. But even when we monitored that project, we found out that some of those projects were not to be seen. And that was really a, a bad situation. Uh, so I, I think we need to unpack the old information. The current ongoing distribution of recovered asset from Abacha's loot is going to the cash transfer for the poorest of the poor in Nigeria. And it's different from the trader money. And so we must be, must be able to separate these two. The trader money is different from the cash transfer to the very poor of the poorest. And what we civil society are monitoring with the World Bank in Nigeria, it is the cash transfer to the poorest of the poor. And this is as a result of the MOU signed between the Nigerian government and the Swiss government. We should be very careful. This is a political time. Politicians want to take an advantage to uh, win votes so they can discredit any policy. And we are also very cautious and careful not to be seen, be accused by either any of the political party. 
But our concern is to always continue to advocate for policies that will empower the very poor of the poor in the country. Mm. And all that's right, why David. we are calling on the Nigerian government mm. um, and all the political party to be conscious when they are campaigning, they have to campaign with fast and because that helps the country. Mm. Because peddling ignorance will not help the country. For instance, I don't see any reason why either of the political party, whether PDP or APC, should not support recovered assets for use for the poor. And I know that either of the political party do support a campaign against corruption. And if you want to campaign against corruption, particularly grand corruption, you need to look for a way how that can benefit the people. Yeah, but the, and both, so the both recovery sides, of assets. Uh, let me come in, uh, David. Uh, both sides, yes, are on the same page as far as fighting corruption is concerned. But the procedure of doing that, how uh, to actually um, fight corruption, uh, seems to be where uh, they both differ. But let's, um, I mean, uh, Lai Mohammed, the information minister, actually said that 60% of uh, uh, looted funds are still within, or, or assets for that matter, are still within uh, the country. How, beyond you know, recovering the ones that have been taken out, you know, out of these shores, how do we recover uh, this, this huge percentage of uh, looted funds that, that's within the country? Well, um, that's why I'm saying, um, you see, the fight against corruption is a hard dock, even right from the past 10, 15, 20 years. And that's why we are saying institutional reform is required to fight corruption in a more systemic way. And that's why the National Assembly must look into the proceed of crime bill, which is currently sitting in the National Assembly. It needs to be passed into law. For instance, if we don't have an asset recovery regime that is transparent and accountable, what we have seen when the list of looted assets were published, and you saw the response from the opposition party, will continue to happen. If you want to have a transparent and accountable asset recovery framework in a country, it needs to be backed by law. Um, but what we have in Nigeria today is pieces of law on asset recovery across the country, and that's not really helped the country. And the current domestic asset recovery process has also not been put in a framework that will define how it should be engaged. And that for me is something that is remarkable that we need to understand in moving forward. And as we approach 2019 presidential election, our strong message to all the political party that is contesting the election is that they must understand that it is very important for them to support the proceed of crime bill because the bill will help any of the government. If APC wins the presidential election, it will help them. If PDP wins the election, it will help them. Any of the political party that is currently contesting the election need an asset recovery regime that will help them to achieve the goal of making sure that grand corruption don't under, 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 under develop the country. Yeah. What we have seen is that corruption is a threat to development in Nigeria. All right, David. And what we have seen is that the political elite are very powerful. They have the instrument to undermine any anti-corruption initiative and so what we need to look at is looking for a creative way innovative way to tackling grand corruption that is all right. mostly this, perpetuated yes. by political elite across the political line all right david this this asset recovery we, yeah. yeah this asset recovery legal framework you're talking about right now uh what would it take to have it passed and what would it take to make it law in the country right now depend or, or let's say at, at what point of um, it becoming law is it right now well uh, first um, the proceed of crime bill is currently at the national assembly the house of rep and the senate they've agreed in principle to harmonize the bill and now our call to the national, the leadership of the National Assembly, because if you look the amount of taxpayers' money that have been invested in going through the process to get this proceed of crime be passed into law, should not be wasted. My appeal to the Senate President, the Speaker of the House of Rep, is to also understand that if Nigeria is their personal business, they will not allow the amount of resources that have been invested in making sure this bill is passed into law.
They should consider it as a priority. It will be a legacy project for them. And they will be remembered that in during their time in the National Assembly, it was when the Proceed of Crime Bill was passed into law. And uh, it will redefine the asset recovery fight in Nigeria. It will help Nigerian government to be able to comply to some of the GIFA principle, the Global Forum on Asset Recovery Forum principle, in particular in having an institutional architecture framework of going about on asset recovery okay. internationally. Now, and that um, will David also send a positive signal to mm. international jurisdictions yeah. like the US, like the UK, the European Union, will be able to cooperate with Nigeria in moving forward in tackling the issue of asset recovery. It's interesting you actually point that, and I wonder how, uh, to what extent, you know, the, these countries are helping Nigeria uh, to prevent uh, corruption. As far as corruption is concerned in Nigeria, a lot of people describe it as the genie that's already out of the bottle. Now, you, you talked about institutions. How do we ensure that the loopholes that allow for corruption in, in public office are actually plugged beyond the uh, bills that you, you, you know, you talk about? Um, a lot of people will well, tell we'll you... Yeah. If, if you fix the economy, yeah. infrastructure, and all of those things and the basic necessities of life, then maybe Nigeria would not face the kind of the level of corruption it's facing now. I, I think we also need to look the norm. Uh, you, know, it, you know, people see corruption as a normal thing because um, the way government have responded has not sent the right positive signal, perhaps. But what I think that is very important Tackling corruption is not just government affair alone. We need to look a collective approach in tackling corruption. And the citizens do have a role to play. For instance, in recovering of the abortion law to Nigeria, citizens are currently monitoring where the money is going to the very poor people across the country. That's one area where we can have a collaborative framework. And then the media also have a great role to play. And for instance, you can see what TVC is doing in the last six months. They've been very consistent in putting such light on how what happened with the recovered Abasha loot. And that for me is something that is very collaboratory that can help the country begin to build a collective actions around the issue of corruption. And then when you talk about the issue of no job, the economy, they do have a role because we need to strengthen the economy for people to have access to a job. But even if people have access to a job, because if you look at the number of people that are actually involved in grand corruption, it's not that they don't have job, they are not poor. If you look at the people that are breaking the law, that are actually using their privileged position to acquire assets that they will never use in their own generations, they are not very poor. So the question is that, is about our culture, our attitude towards to our common wealth, and how we think that we ha want to protect our future generation. Mm. And so the challenge right. is for us to begin to change our attitude, okay. our approach to life, and how we can develop this country. Yeah. And the only way to do that is to begin to change our, 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 our attitude, our norm about what we believe that is the best way to rank people that are successful in the country. Okay. And then how David, do you become a successful politician? All right, how David, do people vote in? We, now 2019 election is coming. Yes. What is the criteria for people to cast their vote. Okay. Do you vote on the basis of because this person is your brother or do you vote because this person is from your um, a Muslim or is your Christian brother? Because the people that steal Nigerian money, they are all friends, they are brothers all right, and sisters David, together. We have to leave it you here now. David, thank from. you so much. You only use it to deceive us. Da oh. David, thank well. you very much for your contribution this morning on the uh, issues around the recovered loot. Mm. Reverend David Dugola is the executive director of African Network for Environment and Economic Justice. Thank you very much.